Well, here we are, folks, again. This is Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. So glad you are tuned in <clears throat> on this particular tidbit today. Uh, we're going to talk today about the redemption that God made all the way from Adam all the way up through the New Testament. We're going to, it's going to be a fairly quick study. It's going to cover several hundred years, several thousand years, actually, to where we are today. And so this is 2018. So this is 2018 years after Christ. And that was uh, 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 over 3,000 years to Christ from the beginning of the earth. Um, uh, actually, uh, probably closer to 4,000 years. And here we are now <coughs> in uh, the 6,000th year of uh, the reign of, of the earth, I believe. And um, so seven is usually uh, completion and eight is usually a new start. So the end of the seventh thousand year, perhaps, will be uh, a, an astronomical year for this earth and for the way God works. Now, we, we don't know very much about God in the big sense of the word. We know what the Bible tells us. And then we have a lot of summation. We have to be careful of summation. Anyway, let's go to the highlights. The highlight of the creation, God's highest creation was mankind. He made this guy and he called him Adam. He was absolutely unique. He was different than any animal. He was different than anything else on the earth. He had the mind of God in his head. He was made after the Trinity. God's uh, Trinity was speaking. Jesus always did the speaking in the Trinity. God did the thinking. Jesus did the speaking. And Jesus spoke and he said, let's make man after our own image. So they made man this way, a body, soul, and spirit. He is a triune, he is a three-section being. He has an eternal life. This eternal life will spend eternity either in hell or in heaven, but it is an eternal life. It's an eternal soul. The soul of man will never die. The only type of death the Bible talks about for the soul of man is total separation from God, and that's considered a death because you will be forever separated from God if you're separated from him when this body goes to the grave. So he made God in his own image. He declared him king of the creation. As he made all the animals, and he made the trees, and the birds, and the bees, and he made everything, and he gave mankind authority over all of it. And man had authority over all of it. How do you think all of the animals came by Adam when he was naming them? He called them. He called them up. He said, come on, all you guys get in line, and walk by here, and I'm going to give you all a name. And he gave him a name. And uh, God had commanded Adam one command that was a don't command, and that was don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that was the only don't that Adam got. And the devil came and convinced him that God didn't mean what he said. And so Adam found out and cast the whole world into a place of what is sinship uh, encouraged to eat after the tree given a wife there are seven facts about Adam here that Adam's sin Adam became the first human sinner chronologically Eve ate first but Adam was the one blamed because he was the man he was the head of the home he was the head of the woman he was the responsible part and so, therefore, he was blamed. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, Romans 5 and 12, so that death was passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And now this death, was called separation from God, is a type of living death. 
and if you separate it from God. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through uh, the su subtlety, uh, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Second Corinthians 11 and 3, there is a very simple situation that Jesus came that he took all the sin of all the world on him. He died on the cross. He paid the penalty. And all we have to do is say, Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. And the penalty is washed away. And we have been given eternal life. Eternal means forever. That's something you can't lose. Can you uh, hurt God's feelings? Yes, you can by not keeping your commitment, by sinning. And then God said, though, I made a way for you that you can just say, God, forgive me, I sinned. And he said, I will cast that sin as far as the east is from the west, never more to be remembered. I will put it in the sea of forgetfulness. Listen, you can't have the thought that you have one sin against you, not one. You can't stand before God with sin. So you have to get rid of it. You have to confess it. And that gets rid of it. So Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. 1 Timothy 2.14 So what are you saying here, Peter? You're saying here that Adam, in his ability to have all the knowledge that he had, knew that he was going to be separated from this woman. And he sinned for this woman, that he could have this woman. And he attempts at first to hide his nakedness. How did he do that? By covering up with some fig leaves. You can't cover nothing from God. But see, he wasn't supposed to know he was naked. And God came in the garden. He said, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, well, we were naked, so we covered ourselves with fig leaves. And God said, who told you you was naked? Have you eaten from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And Adam said, well, you know that woman you gave me? She caused it. She's the one. Blame her. God said, no. You're the head. You are the head of the house. I'm blaming you. I tell you what. You want to see the results of that uh, in a big sense of the word is to bring it up to modern day standards you're given a just say you're a police chief and your your all of your police system falls apart why they're going to vote you out of office and put another chief in right quick and you vote it out if you're a, a, a as a head man in a big large company and they uncover something bad in that company. Man, they, you get the axe, is what they say. Today, you cut off, man. And they put another person in until he gets the axe. And then they put another one until he gets the axe. It's an ever-failing, an ever-failing system. We live in an ever-failing system. Very, very, very seldom does anybody ever live up to the big position, when they're in a big position, they fall by the wayside. Now, there are many who have bought their way out of trouble. That doesn't say that they're clean. That says that they're uh, unclean, but they're hidden by their ability to cover up their uh, failures. And so, we see Adam's physical change. He changed physically from the spiritual condition he was in, that he was pure, to this condition that he had sin in his life and had to have that sin covered up. So he tried to cover it on his own flesh. He couldn't do it then and we can't do it now. We can't cover sin in our life. What we do if we've got sin is we confess it. And if we confess it, he's faithful and just to forgive us of it and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, how did God do that with, uh, with Adam? God took a lamb and shed the blood of that lamb and dressed Adam 
in a blood shedded uh, skin and Eve. He took two lambs, one for each. One lamb did not cover both. He had to take two lambs and cover each one by their own lamb. Each person has to have his own sacrifice because I married a woman doesn't get that woman under my salvation. Her salvation is hers individually. She has to say, God, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul just like I had to say that. And any person, a father can have six children. All six have to make their own confession. A father can't, they can't be covered under their father's uh, Christianity. It's each person for himself has to make this commitment unto righteousness. The Bible said we are dressed in filthy rags. In other words, we're covered up by fig leaves and we're dressed in filthy rags. And the only way we can uh, get to uh, be dressed in righteousness is just by confession. God, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. And then walk circumspectly unto God. How do you do that? You get a Bible. You get a, a, a supposedly a King James Version Bible, a holy Bible. This happens to be called the Key Bible, a very good Bible. And it has a, a, the answer to everything in life is in this one book. This one book has the answer to every single solitary thing in life, everything. And it has the answer by being righteous. It is a righteous book. It is the only righteous book on earth. All many other books write about righteousness, but they aren't righteous. This one is righteous. It is written by God, and therefore it is righteous. God knows foolishness. He knows the sin, the smallest sin of man, and he knows the biggest sin. Sin is sin. There is, and been said before, no big sin and little sin. Sin is a separator. It's just like getting a splinter, and I've had them before. Right there in that finger, and I'm trying to work. And, and until I remove that splinter, every time I move my hand, that splinter is going to cause me grief. And once I get that splinter removed and put a little salve on it and it gets better, then I don't have the problem with it. And that's the way with sin. It's like a splinter in your life. It will crop up every time you go to do something. Here this sin will be before you. He said uh, right here uh, that nothing is covered. God knows everything, Matthew 10, 26. And he knows the kings of the earth. He knows the people of the earth. He knows the parishioner. He knows them that are in dens. He knows them that are covered by rocks. He knows them that are in the grave, by the way. He knows every soul that has ever been born on this earth. And he made a redemption situation for every man. We see a five-fold judgment upon sin that man carries. This was upon the man that he would have to toil. As soon as Adam sinned, uh-oh, God said he could walk around and eat of all the fruit of the trees and do what he wanted to. After he sinned, then God says, hey, now you have to toil. There is going to be thorns and thistles on this earth and you're going to have to cut them down, clean them up and burn them, pile them up and burn them. And upon the woman, he put suffering in childbirth. <clears throat> Immediately after the sin, he put suffering in childbirth. Well, this is a, uh, a, a, in a big sense of the word, this is a wholesome thing uh, if the, Suffering in childbirth is a wholesome thing. It makes a bond that you suffered to bring that child into the world. And now you're going to try to raise that child the best you can. And um, so, and he put upon nature those thorns and thistles and, and, and aimlessness and upon the serpent that he would crawl on his belly 
and that he would bruise the heel of man and man would bruise his head and he would suffer the fatal wound and he did who, who gave it to him promised from Adam to the Savior uh, God sought Adam out and uh, he removed Adam from the garden and the Savior he clothed Adam and the Savior has come and removed us from the garden of sin and said Peter you're drunk you're alcoholic you're cursing you swear you thief I'm going to remove you from this garden of sin that you live in how are you going to do that God well at two o'clock in the morning on November 5th 1972 I'm going to visit you and I'm going to tell you if you don't straighten out right now and ask me to forgive you of your sin come in your heart and save your soul I'm going to leave you alone let you die and go to hell wow that was an awakening that I needed I looked up to heaven right by myself nobody but me and God there and I said Lord I am a sinner forgive me of my sin come in my heart save my soul never took another drink never swore another cuss word from that day to this November 5th 1972 at 2 o'clock in the morning he took a complete drunk thief rogue absolute cursor absolute wicked human being and turned him around and made a righteous man out of him and this is what God did for me and he'll do the same for you this is called redemption I had been redeemed I was redeemed in one instant with one prayer now remember that the ground got cursed because of the snake and that snake was cursed to crawl on his belly and that man would bruise his head and he would bruise the heel of man and this is the picture of Satan coming and bruising Christians coming and bruising people coming and making them do opposite from what righteousness is to do sin and to do things uh, yet man is born into trouble as sparks fly upward Job 5 and 7 man's days are few and full of trouble now upon the woman he said that sorrow shalt thou have in bringing childbirth and upon nature the thorns and the thistles remember there weren't any so he brought the thorns and the thistles now during the millennial reign in the New Testament Paul writes about all this in Romans he said for the earnest expectation of the creation wherewith for the manifestation of the Son of God for the creature was made subject to vanity not willing but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption under the glorious liberty of the children of God for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now now there's going to be a time when God says come up here and he's going to take the saints that are here today and the saints that have been since Jesus left all those that died and are in the grave are going to go up to be with him at this point the immutable sanctification and the principle called the second law of theodynamics came into being this law states that when energy is being transformed from one state to another some of it is turned into heat energy which cannot be converted back into useful form in other words this universe may look upon the wound up clock that is slowly running down this law is expanded in Psalm 102 and 26 and Hebrews 109 he said and thou Lord in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth 
and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They have perished, but the, thou remainest, and they shall wax old as a garment, and as a vesture shall fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. He is saying that he is in control. He has never, God has never been out of control. The devil has been out of control from day one, but God has never been out of control. He's been in control uh, ever since Genesis 2 and 7 where he introduced death. And then in Genesis 3 and 17, he introduced nakedness. And in Genesis 3 and 14, he introduced a curse because of that nakedness. In Genesis 3, 17, he introduced sorrow because of the separation of sin and in man and that. And he introduced the thorns that weren't here originally because of sin. And then he introduced a man had to sweat and work by sweat of his brow on that. And then he introduced again in Genesis 3 and 24 the sword, the sword that killeth, the sword that cutteth. Now, the sword that we want to cut us is the word of God. Now, that's a good sword. It cuts out the old and replaces it with the new. It's like the surgeon coming and fixing somebody. As he dealt with the second Adam now, that is you and I, Hebrews 2 and 9, we can put the old man to death and by that. And, and in, in John 19 and 23, he dealt with the nakedness of not having a spiritual cover. Now, we have a spiritual cover. We got that through saying, Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. In Galatians 3.13, we get rid of the curse. The curse is no longer on the Christian man. The curse is on everybody that lives under the curse in the world. The curse is there, and we're living amongst that curse, and we have to have, we feel some of that curse, but we don't have to live in that curse. We don't have to live in that sorrow, Isaiah 53, 3. I don't have to sorrow about death. A little bit ago, I was doing an excerpt, and my, my wife let a haul right of her, and I had to go tend her. She has a terminal cancer. But I'm not going to let that shake me to the bone because her and I'm going to be together forever. She may go to heaven before me, and she may not. God may choose for me to have a heart attack the same day she does. He may choose to send us together. He may choose to do something different. He may choose to take me first. And we don't know that. We don't know every minute, every second of the day. We don't know what's going to happen, but we have to depend that God is on the scene. And he's the one that knows. He's the one that takes sorrow away. He's the one that says you don't have to sorrow. Sorrow not <laughs> that you're going to die. <laughs> Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Why could you think of anything better? Uh, this, this world really, really has nothing to offer a human being with all the sin there is in it. And it's a pleasure for a time comes to an end. The pleasure for a thief is jail time. He's going to end up in jail and not have any more pleasure in his life. And uh, the, the pleasure for a murderer, the pleasure for a drunk, the pleasure for a man that has pleasures in this world, in sin, the end of it is sorrow. Now this world is slight full of thorns and slight full of thistles. And as you get to be a Christian and you start walking in a Christian life. I used to smoke. Now if you see a Christian smoking, you see a Christian that's caught in a thorn bush. Because he is a Christian, the only way he can be a Christian and not have thorns and thistles in his life is put the things of the world down. 
uh, you see a lady who is a Christian and she's dressed like a harlot. She has got the thorns and the thistles of the world in her dress, the way she's dressing. If she entices men to look at her, the Bible says she's committing sin. To make a reproach on men to look at her, look at her body, showing her much of her nakedness more than she ought to show. And so we see these thorns and these thistles. Now we see that Adam, when he sinned, he brought sweat. Before, he, he, all he had to do was walk around. God gave it to him. Now you and I, if we will rest in God, we don't have to sweat the things of the world. Yes, we need to sweat. Our brow will sweat when we're toiling. But when we're walking through this world with God, we don't have to sweat because of the ways of the world. I had an example last night, just yesterday. I had a tuck back in my wallet. I had a hundred dollar bill tucked in my wallet, a kind of a security thing. And I'm walking out of the church, and I see that um, we have a situation where a hundred dollars is needed for a mission trip. So I go to. I put that hundred dollars in that mission trip envelope. I took it out and I put it in there and just as I passed it to the girl, a man nudged me and put a dollar bill in my hand. And he said, this is for you. My wife and I want to give this to you. And he gave me that dollar bill and rolled up in that dollar bill was a hundred dollar bill. So I put the hundred in obedient to God I put that hundred in, the whole money, I put it in there, and before I could get it out of my hand, God gave me a hundred plus one. <laughs> hey, God is on the throne. He's a good God. He's going to take care of you if you're obedient. You've got to be obedient to be taken care of. And so, we'll be, be obedient. So, I didn't have to sweat it. So carrying that $100 bill around, I was causing myself to sweat the fact that I may have to take it out and use it before the time because I had it as whole money. The bills are coming up the third or fourth of the month, and when they come up, I get a little check, and that check doesn't cover, hardly cover the bills, hardly, barely covers the bills. That's what it does. It doesn't give me any grace money outside of the bills much. So it, it will take care of the bills for the month, and that's it. And uh, you work your life, you pay the government all your life, and they give you a little bit, of, a little bit, just enough to get by on uh, back when the time when you get old enough to get it. So uh, it's not a good. The government's not a good investment. Had I put as much money in an investment account that I put in the government. I would be drawing big dividends. I wouldn't be drawing $700 a month. I'd be drawing $1,700 a month or more. And so that's it. Now, uh, John 19 and 34 deals with the sword. Now, the sword that cuts asunder, it cuts in and it cuts out. That's the Bible. This is the sword in my life. This is the good sword. This is not the sword that cuts your head off and sends you to hell forever. This is a sword that cuts the sin out of your heart. And it cuts in and it cuts out. It cuts in as you take the Word of God in, it cuts in. As the Word of God comes out of you, it takes out of you that which is not supposed to be there in the first place. So this is a good sword. The sword of the Word. If you don't have one of these, this is called Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. Look it up on the internet, find it, buy it. Be the best buy you ever made. Be the best buy you ever made. Hey, you know what I did when I first got saved? I wasn't smart enough to throw them cigarettes right down. So I would do things and I would say, well, three packs of cigarettes cost this much. 
I'm going to do this today and I won't be able to smoke them cigarettes today. And I'd swap something for the cigarette money and get something with it. Well, that's not really a good principle, but it does work. And it will work. And all the time God's dealing with me. He had to deal with me 365 days to get the cigarettes out of my hand. And finally one day, he made me so embarrassed <clears throat> that I couldn't smoke another one. That I got so embarrassed that he was watching me. I went out behind the barn and I lit that cigarette. And I hadn't smoked one in two or three, four days. And, and it made me dizzy and about fell over. And at the same time, I could just have the presence of God came over me. And God said to me, you know I'm out here too behind this barn. <laughs> you can't hide from me anywhere. You asked me into your heart when you walked out here, I walked out here with you. And when you lit that cigarette, it about choked me to death too, just like it did you. And so, uh, you need not to do that anymore. <clears throat> I actually delivered you from that a year ago, but you wouldn't put it down. He said, I delivered you from that the same day I delivered you from cursing and swearing on, on the fifth day of uh, November in 1972. I, 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 I delivered you from that. You had to accept it and do act upon it. And so I acted upon it a year later and acted upon it and God delivered me from that mess and that nasty habit. Not only that, I had to spend God's money to buy them things. God gave me money to run my family and to take care of things and to tie them to do things, but instead I was buying cigarettes with it. I was spending God's money illicitly, if you please. And so, here we are. We are now Christians. We are now following God. We are now in a daily Bible study. How long have you been in it, Brother Peter? I've been in it every day since the day I got saved. I got saved November 5, 1972. I've been in this book every day since then. I have read through this Bible. I have read through many of these Bibles. I have studied through these Bibles. And I have put to heart what God says in these Bibles. What I've seen, I've tried to walk on. I was raised in Maine. And in Maine, you could fish on the ice. You could drive a truck on the ice. But before you did, you had to make sure that before you even walked on it, it was thick enough to walk on. Now, many a person has lost their life walking on thin ice. Many a Christian has lost their peace and their joy in, in their life and everything by walking on thin ice. You need to thicken the ice yourself. You need to thicken it up by getting in the Word and making it to where you can actually not just walk on it, but you can drive the truck on it. And it needs to be thick enough so that you can get out there and cut a hole in the ice, and the ice is a foot and a half thick. And then, you know what? The fishing's good under that ice. We used to go out there and set up that little old building, push it out there with a truck and get it out there and on the skids and, and uh, pull it out there or whatever and, and cut that hole, get in it and cut that hole in the middle of it and, and uh, with an auger and, and, and then we'd drop a fish hook down and zap, you've got a fish. The fish are just as good in the winter as they are in the summer. They're there, winter and summer. Just because they're on the ice doesn't mean you can't catch them and eat them. You have to get to them first. And that's what you have to do in your life. You have to break all of the ice so that you can get down deep in the Bible and catch all the fish there is in here. This is the book to fish in. If you're fishing in another book, be careful. This book right here, Wilmington's Guide to the Bible, is a breakdown of this Bible. It's a breakdown of the King James Version. It doesn't stray from it. It has it verbatim, word for word, what this book says is in here. 
and then he has notations in here for us to look at and to summarize and we're, I'm only on page seven right now and I've been in it one two three four five six seven eight I've been in nine nine excerpts I've been in and I'm only on page seven of summarizing what I've done right here this week this the last week of the year and the first week of the year is I went back to re review and this is review for me I already have I already have tested none the test in this book I've already done this book throughout I've already got the pages marked and, and I've done this book throughout this book has been the book that that God gave me to, to do my, my schoolwork in and my classwork in and I've done the test and I passed the test and I got my certificate. How did they do that? By getting in and staying in, digging in. You can't dig a hole except one shovel full at a time. If you need a deep hole, you have to keep digging. And if you want to put, plant something good in that hole after you plant it, you have to water it. And after you water it and it starts growing, then you have to take care of it, feed it, trim it. Keep the bugs off it. And make it be a good tree. Are you a good tree? Wouldn't it have been something to be there when God parted the, the waters of the Jordan River? <laughs> for a man Joshua who had dug a good hole and planted a good tree himself and flourished and God said whatever you ask I'll do it for you as God purified that water those children of Israel marching around the city of Jericho man and, and, and then the judgment that came to those people in Jericho because they rejected what God had for them. Wow. God is on the scene. Let's remember that. Our time's come and gone. We'll see you next time. This is Brother Peter with tidbits from the world.